Are we recording? Yeah, we're recording. Good, good, good. Okay. How to get started with Forge and Sponge for doing Minecraft modding. This is primarily for my students that are working with me this summer, summer of 2016. I got a link here to the um, actual slides of this presentation. We just have some links embedded in them. So, first some speculations about Forge and why I think Forge the, works the way that it does. So Minecraft, of course, is proprietary code, but it has a, a rich and wonderful modding community. The code's all written in Java, which means it gets compiled to class files and jar files, which are basically zips of class files with a little bit of meta information, are what actually get distributed to users. Now, when you buy the game, you have a right to use that code and do whatever you want with it. You just can't redistribute it or sort of make derived copies. Now, they are very liberal in what they'll allow you to do as far as modding. What they won't let you do is redistribute their intellectual property. Uh, and to make it hard to redistribute their intellectual property, they actually obfuscate their code. And what that means is they compile their code from source files to class files, but then they go and they rename all the methods. There's tools, there's op tools called obfuscators that do this automatically. So they rename all the methods. So instead of having get world and get entity and get block, you'll have A, B, and C. So it's very hard to understand what any of that code does, because even if you decompile it, convert it from bytecode back to source code, it's really hard to read it. So what Forge does is they solve two problems. One, they provide a standardized way to do that decompilation so that when you go in and look at the code uh, it's been decompiled in the same way every time that's actually really important so that all the mods that target this decompiled code target the same way of decompiling it that's the first problem the second problem has to do with intellectual property so if you build a mod that requires decompiling the code and working with it and the, and the code that gets decompiled is often called NMS which stands for net.minecraft.server which is the uh, package name, uh, the Java package name that most of the core code that you need to interact with is located in. Um, so you decompile it. Uh, you can't redistribute that decompiled source code because it's not your intellectual property. That's Mojang's intellectual property or maybe Microsoft's now because they've bought them. Uh, it's their intellectual property. So f but people don't have to redistribute it because everybody just is targeting Forge these days uh, you just use the Forge program to decompile the Minecraft server and produce that source code for you. So everyone that's purchased a copy of Minecraft is allowed to do this for their own personal use, and you can redistribute code that targets Forge. You just can't redistribute the code from Minecraft that has been decompiled by Forge. So it's a subtle distinction, but kind of important. So anyway, what do we need to do? So first we need Forge 1.8.9, we want to download the sponge modding layer. We want to install Gradle support for Eclipse, and we want to import this uh, sponge test plugin into Eclipse. Let's do all the downloads first. Uh, so you want 1.8.9, you want the installer. I've already downloaded this. So I'm not going to download it again. It's in my downloads. Sponge, you want that as well. Um, you want 1.8 layer. Uh, I've already downloaded that as well. Gradle support for Eclipse. Um, I already have it installed. It might come default these days. Apparently you can like drag this to your workspace so you could like put this drag. Maybe you'd have to make this smaller, but you could like drag that over onto Eclipse. You can also install things uh, through help, install new software. I don't know if you would put like Gradle up here or something. Maybe it would it would search to find it. Node Eclipse updates, Gradle IDE pack. Yeah, and maybe I mean I have a lot of stuff installed. This might just be extra stuff that I didn't really need. Um, what is already installed, you could, you know, yeah, I've already got Gradle, you could uh, go through here and just make sure that you've got Gradle installed because we're going to use it. And then finally, the last thing we need is this sponge test plugin. This is just sitting in my um, Google Drive. And so to download that, you actually don't want to click on this. This is totally unintuitive. This opens up the zip file and lets you see stuff inside it. I honestly can't think of a single instance where that is useful as an unlabeled default. I'm not saying it's never useful, I'm just saying it's not a good default. So you gotta click on that button to download and um, throw this in your downloads folder or wherever you're putting things. I've already downloaded it again, so um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna do it one more time. 
So the first thing we need to do is download and run Forge. I'm going to do all this command line. Actually, let me just show you where those downloads ended up. So if we go here to downloads, you can see here's my, uh, I can get rid of that. Here's my installer. This is a log file. I can get rid of that. Here's my sponge forge, and here's my sponge test. So those three things have been downloaded. Now when I run forge, I need to decide where it's going to go. Um, I'll go ahead and double click this to start it up, uh, to double click it. And I need to pick a place for it. There we go. Install server. I need to pick a directory. Now where I want to put it, projects, I'm going to make a folder in here called forge. And that's where I'm going to put it. Um, now I need to go back to here. Um, for some reason, when you run Forge, it puts you in your, you know, application support on a Mac. I don't even know where it would put you on Windows. Uh, I want to go here into Project Forge. Oh, right, and then don't double click into Forge. Just like single click on Forge and do choose, and then say OK. So that's going to be installing the server. Now, while that's happening, I'm just going to let that happen. I need to import my Eclipse project. So let's do File, Import. And I want to import General Existing Project into Workspace. Uh, and I want to select an archive file, Browse. And remember, this was in Downloads. There we go. And there it is, Sponge Test. So I'm going to say OK. And I want that. So that's going to go ahead and install this. Uh, project that's going to uh, import it in here. So if I open this up, this is sponge test. Uh, it's a simple sp uh, Minecraft mod that targets sponge, and sponge of course targets forge. Um, this is the code that we're going to work with and the actual plugin that we're going to install and use. Now before we do that, um, let's go back and prepare for things. So if we go back here, um, this is where we had started installing Forge. It says it's successfully downloaded. That's great. Uh, downloaded and installed here in the Forge. So if you go in here, you can see we've got this universal jar file. We've got a bunch of libraries that it needed, and we've got this Minecraft server jar file. And if you're on a Mac and you have things set, you know, I get these weird DS store files. Uh, I'm going to actually do the next step using Terminal because it doesn't seem to work otherwise. So there we go. Oh. Sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I'm going to go, here's my home directory. I'm going to go into Projects Forge. And if you look, there's the stuff I just installed. I'm going to do java-jar forge uh, and start this up. Now, it's not going to work the first time. And the reason it doesn't work the first time is I hadn't have not accepted the EULA, the end user licensing agreement. And you see it pops up my little console here. Everything sort of looks okay, and you do accept the EULA. Okay, no problem. So you can open this with a text editor. I'm, of course, old school, so I'm going to do the I. Um, there we go. Now if I run it again, it'll work, but I don't want to run it again. I want to get it ready to be modded. So if we look, we've got this mods folder. If we look in the mods folder, I'll go ahead and do this from here because it'll probably make more sense. So if you look in the mods folder, there's nothing in there. Um, this is where we have to put SpongeForge, um, our modding API. Let me copy that, and I'm going to just go in here to Mods, and I'm going to drop it in there. This is SpongeForge. I should probably explain for a second why SpongeForge is important. So I mentioned Forge is the standard community-supported system for, at least I think it is, for decompiling the proprietary Minecraft source code uh, sorry, bytecode and producing source code that modders can then target. So they have a standard set of source files that all the modders can target. But remember, instead of having get world and get entity and get block, you're going to have methods A, B, and C. What Sponge does is it actually provides sensible method names that target the decompiled method names. So it's a layer that kind of sits on top of Forge that makes the job of modding a lot easier. Um, so that's the dream, at least that's how I understand it to work so far. So uh, now Sponge is in there, um, which targets Forge. So now when we start this server up, it will start up Sponge, and then Sponge will load any other mods. So now we're basically ready to go, 
except that we don't have any mods other than sponge, so we want to get our mod ready. So we come over here to sponge test. Uh, and I don't want this with Project Explorer. I want this with Window, Perspective, Open Perspective, Other. I want this with Package Explorer. Well, let's try a Java view. Yeah, let's open the Java Perspective. Bam, there we go, Package Explorer. Yeah, so if we open this up, um, I'm going to make this bigger. There we go. So we can sort of look in here. We've got just this one plugin file, which we'll go through this and look at this in more detail. Let's look at build.gradle. So um, I should just ignore that and pretend it's fine. Uh, we're creating Nox Sponge. Um, so the first thing we probably have to do, we're going to right click this. We're going to come down here to Gradle. And we're going to say refresh dependencies. And we'll see if this does anything. It actually didn't. That's really interesting. Um, the reason we would do that is Gradle depends on a bunch of things. So if you look in here, this is all of the stuff that Gradle is downloading and managing on its own. So if you're familiar with Eclipse, you'll often have to like drop jar files into like a lib folder and then add them to your build path or something. Um, this is doing all of that for us. Uh, what we've done is we've gone in here and we've said, hey, Gradle, I depend on this, and um, here's where it's located. Uh, this is some URL where the providers of Sponge provide their jar files, and so Gradle just knows to go grab that stuff and install it. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, now what this does, this creates a jar file. Let's go ahead and try to run that. So if you go to this build.gradle, we right-click this and we say run as Gradle build. Um, this window pops up. This window, if you hit control space in here, it comes up with a list of things. What I want to do is I want to create the jar file. So I'm going to come down here to jar. I guess I double click that and then say run. So Gradle makes a bunch of calls and you can see it creates this jar file. Now the jar file actually goes in build libs. You can see it's created this jar file with the version number and the name I told it to have here. Um, so it's a jar file that has all this useful stuff in it. Now the next thing I need to do is um, copy this jar file. I could just directly copy it from here, but you know, we're programmers, we like to automate things. So this path here into users, jspaco, that's me, projects, forge, mods, um, what this task is going to do, it depends on jar, so it's going to run the jar task first to produce that jar file, which is essentially our, our mod, and then it's going to copy that mod into the mods folder of forge. Let's go ahead and try that out and see if it actually works. Uh, so do run as. And the distinction between these two Gradle tasks, the first one I think just reruns whatever the last command was. This one brings up this menu. And so I can go in here and I should be able to say control space and go down here. Yeah, and I want to do copy task. There we go. Tell this to run. And I think this worked. Let's test if it worked. We'll go over here. We'll go into mods. It totally worked. Okay, cool. Le now, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Okay, okay, okay. We're going to run our server. We've set the EULA to true, so that should work. So we're starting up our server. I already have Minecraft running. Oh, let me let me restart Minecraft. Um, see how that goes. Oh, oh, look at this. We replaced 229 ore recipes with chocolate chip cookie recipes. We're initializing things. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Oh, wait till you see this really cool message that I put in there. Oh, look, we're initializing the world. Oh, this is fantastic. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. It's totally going to work. Oh, we're preparing a spawn area. I wonder if it loaded our mod. Let's look. Uh, a lot of log messages in here. It's hard to say. Okay, good. We're up and running. Now we should be able to connect. I'm going to do multiplayer and connect to the server that I just started up. It's running on localhost, so I should be able to just find it. You can see, here I come. It found me. Oh, look at that. There I am. Wow, I'm in a wintry looking biome. That's exciting. Okay, good. Now, um, if... Oh, I don't have... Really? Seriously? Let me opt myself. Ha! Look at that. Hello there, my dear friend. 
Now, why did it just do that, you might ask? Well, I'll show you. So if we look at uh, this... Wow, that font is way too... Well, I'm not going to go fix the font. Maybe I can just do plus. No, I can't. Um, wow, this font is really small. So you can sort of see what's happening. Uh, we've got a class for saying plug-in. This is an annotation. Annotations are stronger than comments, but weaker than code. So it's meta information. It's saying like, hey, here's a here's a ID and a name for this plugin, the version number. I don't know. I just made this stuff up. Uh, description of what it's doing. Uh, this is injecting some stuff into it. You can see we're not using this. We are using the logger. Um, this is an idiom that it uses to sort of configure and inject code. It, it's a pretty cool thing. I don't know a lot about it yet. Still learning. Um, listener here, this is essentially a callback. It's saying, hey, um, when a game starting server event happens, do this. And then if you look at this and see what this does, well, first it's saying this log info, hello from Sponge. So if we go and like dig through all these messages, we'll actually see hello from Sponge in here somewhere. I didn't see it. Maybe you have better eyes, and so you'll see it. Um, I knew I should have run this inside Emacs so I could search. Well, then, yep, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Well, there it is. Hello from Sponge. Ha ha! So you can see when uh, this thing started up, this happened. Now what it's doing, it's creating a command spec. Um, so it's this is chaining a bunch of method calls together. Builder, description, permission, executor. So these are all little method calls. Um, and so, and then this is an anonymous inner class here. So we're sort of like creating a new instance of something that implements this interface on the fly. And then what we're doing is we're taking the source of the command, which is basically the player that invoked it. Hello there, my dear friend. That's the command that we're sending. We set this permission. Why did we set this permission? I don't know. It was in the documentation to do something like that, uh, something that we need to experiment with. And then once we have this little uh, command built, we're then taking the command manager registering this, which is our plugin, um, with this command, and then these are the things you can do to actually run it. Now we also have this other command here, drill baby drill. Um, I'm calling this Palin because of course her motto was drill baby drill. And so if we go ahead and run this, you know, you can see some fantastic stuff happen. Watch this. We're going to run Palin. Boom. Look at that. It drilled all the way through the world. Let's jump in there and see what happens. Whoa! Bam! Of course I died. Great. Where did... Oh, let me just not run into that again. Where is it? There it is. There's our penguin hole. Let me just go right... Yeah, look at that. Okay, cool. Uh, and so you can see the way it did that. Um, we got the name of the world and got the world and then uh, checked if the source, remember the source is the command source, whatever instantiated this command, which could either be a player, because, you know, you did, whoops, you did, you know, this, um, or it could be the console, because you could always type your commands in here. Um, in this case, it's player, so it sees that this is an instance of player, it does a downcast, and then it does this other stuff, sends the drill baby drill message, gets the location, um, gets a vector 3i. It's basically 3i, the i's for int. So it's getting a vector uh, of the block position. And then we're getting the x, y, uh, well, x and z coordinates out. We're getting the y coordinate here. So the y coordinate right below us. And we're going while well, it's greater than 0. Uh, y minus minus. So we're basically counting down and converting everything under us at the x, y, and z coordinate to air. Um, so that's drill baby drill. We're just turning everything into air so then we can kind of jump into this hole and drill all the way down to the last little bit of bedrock before you break through the earth and smash through uh, and then fall out of the world and to your death. And so these are the commands that I put there for that. Um, that's actually a fairly, hopefully, uh, succinct tutorial of how all this works. That actually works uh, fairly well. So let me disconnect from this. Uh, that was good. This is running. I can now stop it. Um, now, this theoretically should work if you just kind of double-click it, although I was having trouble with that a while ago. Um, these are executable jar files, so it should be possible to double-click them. When you type java-jar command line, I think that's basically what it does, but it wasn't running before, and I don't really know why. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's starting up. So, I do everything command line.
uh, to be safe. Okay, well, that, let's go back to uh, make sure we covered everything. Right, we start the server, we ran the commands, looks really good. Um, I showed the code for these, and then just one other note, you know, there's plenty of documentation on Sponge. Uh, it's, it's, it's fairly well documented. Uh, go through a lot of this stuff, look at different things to do. I've only done a tiny amount. There's a whole lot more to do, a whole lot more than you know, it looks like it has a lot of potential, and I think because it's explicitly targeting Forge, and it's under um, a, a weak open source license, I think it's the MIT license or the Apache license, I think it's MIT, which basically says you can't sue the people, but you can do whatever, you can mix it with whatever other code you want. I don't think you'll have the same intellectual property issues that befell Bucket. OK, 